And it's my pleasure to introduce Nigel Lochner, director of the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory and a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Nigel is an experimental high energy particle physicist and manages the premier U.S. facility for high energy physics research. In my opinion, a national gem. Nigel earned a BS from York University in Toronto and a PhD from Ohio State University. He worked as a member of the Mark II collaboration at SLAT, where he and collaborators determined the unexpectedly long lifetime of the bottom quark. He joined the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania in 1984. <laughs> He's obviously discovered the secret of immortality, which is the subject of another talk later this year. And since then has pursued high energy particle experiments focusing on symmetry testing and properties of the heaviest quarks, especially the bottom quark. Before taking on the directorship at Fermi Lab, Nigel was director at Triumph, or Triumph, or both, Canada's premier national laboratory for nuclear and particle physics, where he oversaw substantial growth, built strong ties to Canadian and international high energy facilities, and considerably expanded Triumph's contributions and, and role in the worldwide physics community. Nigel is a fellow of the American Physical Society and recipient of the 2006 Panofsky Prize for his leading research on the bottom quark. His talk tonight is entitled, Understanding the Quantum Universe, Mysteries of Massive and Almost Massless Particles. Nigel? I wasn't sure what the audience knows, so I just assumed you know everything. <laughs> and we'll go from there. Actually, I'll, uh, hopefully there's something for everybody. It's like a Disney movie. You know, something for the young ones and something for the, the more senior ones. All right, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of Fermilab, because I thought you might like to know that. So there's a history lesson involved here. I'll give you an introduction to particle physics, which uh, should help the uh, neophytes in that subject. Then I'll talk about quarks. I'm going to talk about the Higgs. And the real goal of this evening is to talk to you about neutrinos and, and their role in the universe. So you may recognize a few of these people here. The one on the left, anyone recognize that person? That's correct, Isaac Newton. Uh, whoops. There we go. That's not Isaac Newton. That's, uh, let's see if I can pick. There we go. Okay. Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein. So this is the guy that thought about mass in the first place. This is the person who thought about energy and mass. This is Peter Higgs, who, whose theory is what gives mass to the particles, and we'll come back to that. And this is Bose, Higgs boson. So uh, he is the collaborator with Einstein, in fact, who understood the statistics of particles. So all of these uh, people play a role in what I have to say tonight. All right, no lecture can begin without a quotation from Einstein. So let me read it. One cannot help but be in awe contemplating the mysteries of eternity of life and of the marvelous structure of reality. So we're going to talk a little bit about structure and reality this evening. So let's start with Fermilab. Goes back to 1968. This is the uh, first director of Fermilab, Bob Wilson. This is uh, this is Glenn Seaborg, a very famous uh, chemist. And this is what Seaborg said: Proton energy is the single most important parameter to be extended. So at this time, the goal of building Fermilab was to provide collisions at the highest energy in the world. And Fermilab led the world in energy in that period in, a, in an accelerator which you know is the Tevatron Collider, and that's where I, I spent most of my career working. So that's a 20, 20 year long period of being on top, if you like. The Tevatron was turned off, and it was succeeded by the Large Hadron Collider in CERN, which I'll, I'll come to in a little bit. 
some more history. So the National Academy of Sciences, and it's headed by Emmanuel Piori, wrestled with the detailed evaluation of 126 proposals that included well over 200 sites in 46 states. I don't know which four are, are, are missing, uh, but nevertheless, it was the Batavia High School marching band that made the difference. They were assumed to be the best, and therefore it went to Fermilab. Here's the picture where they obviously are starting to uh, dig the hole for the accelerator. So this is uh, one, I say one half of the high rise. This is, this is where my, my colleagues and I do our, uh, do our duties every day. We work in here and uh, it is a laboratory which I would say is unsurpassed in its beauty. Because Bob Wilson was an architect as well as a physicist. And so if you go there, you'll see that it's been, the, the site has been created by an architect. So there's sculptures, there's reflecting pools, there's all kinds of great things. As much as I love CERN, Fermilab is, at least from that standpoint, is, is a more beautiful lab. And of course, presidents like particle physicists, uh, as, as you know. I think that's true. All right, so Fermilab, this is the original site of Fermilab. These uh, numbers on here represent farm houses and small farms. So I cannot imagine in the present day just going in somewhere and saying, okay, we're taking this over, folks. We're taking your farms from you. But they did in those days. In fact, I live at Fermilab. My house is at Fermilab. I live in one of those farmhouses. So it's very nice. This is uh, one of the original families. So they've made an effort to try and understand who lived where, who did what, all that kind of thing. is quite interesting. And you can see some of the people that live there. You can go to the Fermilab website and see that. That's the lab today, which is, uh, there's the high rise. My house is in the woods here somewhere. Cannot be seen from Google, so I'll say. <laughs> You've all perhaps heard of Leon Letterman, who was uh, another director at Fermilab. So Leon's <laughs> physics is not religion. If it were, we'd have a much easier time raising money. So that's, uh, and of course, he's the one who coined the Higgs uh, boson, the God particle. All right, so my main point tonight, so there's going to be some subtlety here, so you got to pay a little bit of attention to what I'm talking about. But the point I'm making is, is kind of a different angle from what you're normally hearing. So the wide, wide range of quark masses is puzzling. They go from quite small to very large. So we don't know why there's this broad range of quark masses. The top quark discovery was an exclamation mark on that. So I was involved in that. The experiment I was head of discovered the top quark. It has the mass of 175 protons. It's the mass of a gold atom. It's an object which has no structure that we're aware of. It's a fundamental particle that has the mass of a gold atom. The ultra-tiny neutrino mass doesn't fit into the standard model. And I think as you saw in my abstra abstract, the neutrino is about a hundred billion times lighter than the proton. So from a physicist standpoint, who's trying to write down a, a set of equations which would describe mass, that, that there's obviously something there we're not understanding. So that's, that's part of the story tonight. Now the Higgs boson discovery has brought flavor, so I mentioned the top quark, you've heard of the bottom quark, that's what flavor means, it's, and we give them various names. So there's strange, charm, bottom, top, they're flavors of quarks. Flavor and mass are related in a very interesting way, and that's what we're going to be talking about. However, I think our future lies in better understanding the neutrinos, and you're going to hear me say, that there's basically two classes of matter in the universe. There's, there's leptons and there's hadrons. And the quarks are part of the hadrons and the leptons are the leptons and neutrinos are the neutral leptons. So we're gonna be interested in, in uh, primarily their mass, but there's all sorts of things. Turns out there's three types of neutrinos. There's an electron, there's a muon, and a tau neutrino. And each of them has a different mass, we think. We're not sure. We're not sure of the order. We're not sure of the value. But I'll tell you that we know they have some mass. So the big question now is, why are their masses so small? And, and this is a property of neutrinos, which we're still trying to figure out. So that's going to be the thrust of the laboratory, I'll say, for the next 20 years, 
will be trying to answer this question. And then that is related somehow to the matter antimatter asymmetry in the universe, which you've heard about. And it's also related to the structure in the universe. So those of you who have followed the exciting gravitational wave discussion of the last few weeks, the neutrinos actually play a big role in that, and I'll come in, come in and discuss that at some point. I'm a big fan of this guy, Ben Franklin. So we think of Ben Franklin as the con consummate practitioner, but he wants to turn off gravity. So can you imagine sitting around having a discussion with Ben Franklin, and he says, the rapid progress true science now makes occasions my regretting sometimes that I was born so soon. So he would have fun today, there's no question. It is impossible to imagine the height to which may be carried. In a thousand years, didn't take that long by the way, the power of man over matter, we may perhaps learn to deprive large masses of their gravity. Interesting concept. So how would you deprive them of gravity? You could do two things. You could turn off the gravitational field, or you could turn off the Higgs field. I'm going to come back to discussing that. All right, searching for the fundamental building blocks of matter. So there's your salt for your french fries. That's what it looks like if you zoom in a little bit. You zoom in a little bit more, and there's your atom. So we all know what an atom is. It has a nucleus with protons and neutrons, and there's the electrons around the outside. And that, that's about as much as you need to know until the next slide. <laughs> So what is matter? Well, you've all seen this on your wall in your chemistry class, and uh, you weren't sure what it was all about, but it really is a, a wonderful uh, organization of, of atoms. Just keep adding a proton. Every time you add a proton, you add an electron. Obviously, a good engineer to put that together. So now the question is, how do we find mass? So I've used the mass. It's not mysterious. It's pretty much what you think mass is. You, you're, it's you. You, you have mass. So the property of a body that is a measure of its inertia and that is commonly taken as a measure of the amount of matter it contains and causes it to have weight in a gravitational field. So when you stand on the scales in the morning, you have mass. You may be happy with that mass, I don't know, but the more the merrier. This is uh, Einstein getting involved a little bit here. But you know, when you push on something, it resists. That's inertia. And when you weigh something in a gravitational field, that's gravitational mass. They're the same. And if you think about it, you'll say, geez, that's not obvious at all. But that happens to be a fact at the moment, and the general relativity of source spends a lot of time on that. Now, this is a practical lesson about mass and energy, which we'll be talking about. So Ben Franklin is famous for trying to kill and cook a turkey with electrostatic energy. So you know what that is, dragging your socks over the floor and touching the doorknob. So he thought somehow he could use that for something useful. Again, a practical man. Uh, he succeeded. He said it did not taste very good. <laughs> I don't know if you would call that sushi, I'm not sure, but uh, Franklin was the innovative, if nothing else. So what gives mass to the proton? So we're going to talk about the Higgs giving mass to the quarks, but it turns out the quarks themselves inside of the proton play a very minor role in the actual mass of the proton. Most of the energy and mass of the proton comes from the gluons inside, the motion of the gluons, the gluons themselves being massless, and the motion of the quarks. So the mass of the proton in the nucleus, and that's true of the neutron, is coming primarily from motion. It's not coming from something that you think of as a little pellet. There's no, there's no little thing called mass when you get down smaller and smaller in our present thinking. So keep that in mind. So E equals mc squared. If something has energy, then it's going to have mass. And you're going to see that is the origin of mass in the Higgs mechanism. So this is well known. So if you're a nuclear physicist, you say most of the mass of matter comes from my field. And if you're a particle physicist, you have to say, well, yeah, I guess we don't contribute very much. But it is an important component, as you'll see. So these are the basic building blocks. These are the six quarks that exist. And we may be finished. We're not actually expecting to find more quarks. We look 
because we're experimental scientists, but there are six. The up and down, the charm and strange, top and bottom. This is what the world is made out of. This makes protons and neutrons. Here's your electrons, so now you've got the atom in those three, and these are your neutrinos. You notice I've, I've broken them up into leptons and quarks. So the, the difference is these are quite a bit heavier than these, although there are anomalies in this as you go across here. But basically, the universe that you and I see every day is in this first, we call this a family or a generation. There's three generations or three families, but this is, this is where all the activity takes place, all chemistry takes place here and so on. These particles decay, this decays, but the three neutrinos are very interesting objects which we're going to get into a little bit more. These particles are related to the forces that hold the particles together, and the Higgs, the Higgs is just different. The Higgs is a field that permeates the universe, and it's there, and its function seems to be to give the quarks and the leptons their mass. Now, if you were Peter Higgs, you would think you were finished, and you would say, we're done, nice work. But in fact, the question most physicists are asking now is, does the Higgs really give the mass to the neutrinos? And that's what we're going to try and understand. The quick answer is no. So here's a little history. The first detection of neutrinos was in the 1950s, predicted to exist in the 1930s. So there's the electron neutrino. So it's the neutrino associated with the electron. It's a neutral particle. It interacts only through the weak interaction. I'll, I'll give you some of its properties, but uh, it's, uh, it's everywhere. It's, it's the most, uh, there are more neutrinos than any other matter particle that exists, for example. So that's the first neutrino. Second neutrino. Again, uh, so now, we, now we're up to two. Nobel Prize is given every time you find a neutrino, so maybe that's a hint. You should be looking for the neutrino. And the third neutrino, which uh, came out of uh, Fermilab. So here's the, the happy group, and there's, there's the bottom of the high rise with Wilson's name on it. So that's the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. All right, so then we started talking about getting neutrinos from the sun. So this is uh, the Homestake Mine. It's a gold mine in South Dakota. This is going to be uh, part of the story coming up later. But here is an experiment underground. This is the famous experiment of Ray Davis, who was in the office next to me. And Ray is famous for uh, observing a shortage of neutrinos from the sun. The Nobel Prize was eventually given to him for that work. Here's the data. So once a year, Ray would open his drawer, he'd pull out the graph, he'd put another point on the graph for the year, and that was it. He'd put it back in the drawer. Now you know, and I know, you're supposed to publish, right? He didn't publish. He didn't have to publish. But everybody wanted to know what the next point, where the next point was going. So the bottom line is, he combines all these years together. There's the combined result sitting here. This is the production rate in atoms per day that he's finding. So that's measuring neutrino interactions. And this is what the standard model of the sun produced. So everybody, including myself, thought must be the experiment. There must be something wrong with the experiment. And this result stood forever. He never lost uh, interest in doing it. This is a picture of the sun in neutrinos. It's a neutrino image of the sun. The number of neutrinos going through your thumbnail, I'll just use your thumb because it's about a square centimeter, is 100 billion per second. So you're really being flooded with those things as you sit there. Now your body is much more than a square centimeter, so I don't, I don't want to guess how many square centimeters your body is, but <laughs> multiply 100 billion times that, and that's how many are going through your body in any given time. All right, so a new era for neutrino physics came along. There was an experiment in Japan called Super-K. It discovers neutrinos mix in 1998. Here's the inside of the experiment. It's 50,000 tons of water. It's in the Kamiokande mine. 14,000 of these photodetectors, and each photodetector is about this big. You can barely pick it up. They're, they're humongous. And there's the 
Japanese scientists uh, polishing the tubes, making them uh, look good for the camera, I guess. But you get some sense of the size of this thing, and then it fills up with water, and then you wait for interactions. Now, it was originally built for proton decay. People think protons decay. But in fact, it changed over part of its life, and then it became part of the, the search for neutrinos. And they, they're credited with discovering neutrino mixing. So the mystery of the mixing neutrinos from Ray Davis's data is that the sun creates electron neutrinos. And those, they travel through space coming to the Earth. And on their way to the Earth, they change into another type of neutrino. Sometimes it changes into the muon neutrino, sometimes into the tau neutrino. So by the time it gets to the Earth, if your detector only sees electron neutrinos, you're going to think some are missing. And that was the case. So his detector only saw electron neutrinos, some were missing. So this kind of proved, or at least hinted at the fact that he was probably right, but it was not definitive. So the way this graph works is the blue line says at the beginning, this is, this is some distance away from where the neutrinos have been created, you have 100% of one type of neutrino. Let's say these are electron neutrinos. And then at some distance, you start to lose electron neutrinos and muon neutrinos start to increase. So that at some distance, all the electron neutrinos have changed into muon neutrinos. And then as you keep going, they change back into electron neutrinos, then back into muon neutrinos. So when I talk about mixing, I, I do this. It's just the them oscillating back and forth between each other. Now, there's actually three types of neutrinos. So it's a little more complicated than I said, but that's the basic idea. All right, so there's an experiment in Canada, the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. Sudbury is a, a very cold place in, uh, in Ontario. This is one kiloton. So remember the one in Japan was 50,000 tons. This is one kiloton. And this is heavy water. So Canada actually has a lot of heavy water. So it's, it's uh, extra neutron in the, in the nucleus of uh, this, rather than hydrogen as deuterium. Anyways, there was an experiment there with Canadians, the US, and the UK. And the deficit was seen in the electron neutrinos from the sun. So they could see the right number missing. But they had another technique with the heavy water where they could look at the sum of all neutrinos. So they knew the total neutrino flux matched, ma uh, matched the prediction of the calculation that had been made originally. So this kind of closed the story. It's all understood now. The, the, sun, the model of the sun works extremely well for the number of neutrinos that are made in the fusion process, and we understand how they mix. Now, what have we learned in the meantime? So there's, there's, a, there's a subtlety here that you need to know that if neutrinos mix, they must have some mass. And in fact, what they have to have is a difference in mass. And so there's two hypothesized uh, distributions for these three particles. So I'm going I'm to tell you something now which is a little confusing, but you've got to listen carefully. So when we talk about a neutrino having a mass, we say M1, M2, M3. Physicists are not too sophisticated. There's three of them, so there's three masses. If I talk about flavors, I talk about the electron flavor, the muon flavor, and the tau flavor. Turns out the electron flavor, when it is, is it has the form of pure electron neutrino when it's created, it's actually a linear combination of the mass eigenstates, as we refer to them, for those of you who know. So it's a combination of the M1, M2, M3. It doesn't have a real unique mass. It has some probability distribution of having a mass range, if you like. So the electron neutrino is one mixture. So this, the red here is referring to the electron neutrino. The, the green is the muon neutrino, and the blue is the tau neutrino. So you can see the M1 is a mixture of electron neutrino, muon neutrino, and tau neutrino. 
The two is a slightly different mixture, and the three is, look at, there's hardly any red here. So the three masses are different mixtures of three flavors. And this can be turned around, and you can say a flavor is mi mixture of three masses, or a mass is a mixture of three flavors. And this is important in how they travel through space. So as an experimentalist, when I make a neutrino, I make it in a flavor eigenstate. I make it with a pure flavor. So I create a muon neutrino. But as soon as it starts moving through space, it starts oscillating into those, those other three states. And so when I stop it, it may actually be something else. And so that's what you're looking for. All right, now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the heaviest quark, the top quark. This is the experiment that I was involved in at Fermilab. It's called the CDF experiment. This is the D0 experiment. These are the two experiments that discovered the top quark. You can see the happy people in this picture. You can see that the Italian newspapers were excited about this for some reason. All right, so now we're going to sh I'm going to show you I've shown you already the three families. I'm going to show you the three families with little uh, balls next to them. And the, the area of the ball refers to the mass of the quark or the lepton. So this is the up quark, down quark. There is a little speck there. That's the uh, electron neutrino. And there's the electron. So even the electron neutrino is much, much smaller than the electron. Now we go to the second generation, charm, strange, muons. So the charm now is quite heavy. This was discovered at Stanford in an experiment that I worked on. Strange quark. There is its spec still there, still very small, and there's the muon. So, so the electron got very heavy, the up got heavy, this got heavy, but that stays roughly the same size. There's the top. So the top is huge. It's ridiculous. That's what we discovered. There's the bottom. There is a speck still here. And there's the tau. I don't think you have to be a physicist to say there's something strange there, right? These, these are so small, they look like they don't belong. So the question is, why are they so small? Answer, there is no answer. So that's, that's where we are. All right, so I want to say a little thing about few things about the quarks. So quarks are difficult to study because the strong force, which is called quantum chromodynamics or QCD to its friends, combines them into mesons and baryons that have net color charge. Quantum chromodynamics is, a, is the uh, strong description of the strong force as it relates with, with color charge. The top quark is an exception because it, de it decays in 0.1 yoctoseconds. Does anybody know how long a yoctosecond is? It is the word associated with the shortest unit of time in the English language. Yes? Close, very close. 10 to the minus 24, as I remember. But it depends where you live, it turns out. <laughs> the, the English have another uh, interpretation for it, as usual. So, OK. The other five flavors of quarks account for hundreds of mesons and baryons. So there's, there's a real particle zoo out there, but uh, the quarks themselves are hard to study. The force is carried by the Z boson, the photon, and the gluons. Remember, there was a few particles here that handled the forces. Do not change the flavor of a quark. But the W boson carries electric charge, and so changes both the charge and the flavor of a quark. So you can convert an up quark to a down quark by emitting a W. And that's what this drawing is showing you. You're starting off with a down. The neutron is a down, down, and an up. It's made of three quarks. And this quark emits a W, and it turns into a U. So it's possible for one flavor to mix into another flavor in quarks. So that's the message to remember. Here's an example, we, I, just, just to be confusing, we use the same name for whether they're mixed or not mixed, so that's just, that's just, just to make the students frustrated. In this language, the W boson interaction has some probability of converting any of the three up-type quarks into any of the three down-type quarks. So here's a B quark matched with a strange quark, makes a meson, 
emits a W and changes into a charm cork. So bottom changes into charm. So you're seeing transitions vertically in the family. Now, you can also take a B0 meson, which is a combination of a B quark and, and, a, and a light quark. The B can mix, this can mix, and if you look at the beginning and the end, what you see is a B, B meson has changed into an anti-B meson, and these can mix back and forth between each other. So these are all quantum mechanical effects at the quark level. The oscillation of the B sub S meson, so that's a B meson combined with a strange, a B quark combined with a strange quark, was discovered at Fermilab in 2006 in the experiment that I worked on, and it was measured to occur at a rate of three trillion times per second. So the B0 strange quark is going into its antiparticle and back and forth three trillion times a second. So now we've really started to see that the quarks like to mix amongst themselves. Now I have to introduce another term, CP symmetry, so Dirac, Paul Dirac, famous physicist, and onwards. The physicists assume that nature does not have separate rules for particles and antiparticles. The equations are the same. This is called CP symmetry in our language. The C refers to charge symmetry. It changes the sign of the electric charges. So a plus would go to a minus, or a minus would go to a plus. And P is parity, which changes the handedness of a particle, left-handed or right-handed is the way we talk about it. And CP does both. It interchanges a left-handed electron, shown here. So there's the charge of the electron. This arrow is showing you its spin. And there's the spin in the opposite direction and the charge change. So there's the electron changed into its antiparticle, the positron, a right-handed positron. We'll come back to that. The no it was good enough to get the Nobel Prize for a few clever guys. It was a big surprise in 64 when uh, Jim Cronin and Val Fitch showed that neutral k on oscillations, similar to the one I just described, have this small asymmetry. And what that means physically is that as, uh, and I'll just say it for the B mesons, as the B meson travels one way, its rate of traveling back is different. So there's a preferred direction from matter into antimatter than ma antimatter back into matter. Everybody thought it would be equal, but it's not. And now you're starting to say, well, geez, if that is true, what happens in the early universe when you expect to have equal amounts of matter and antimatter if the rate between the two is different and it decays, then it's possible you end up more with one than the other. And that's that's the basic argument. And then it was discovered in a different way in another experiment at Fermilab uh, later on with Kaons. So Kaons have provided a tremendous amount of information to our understanding of particles. Uh, Steven Weinberg and Abdul Salam realized that a Higgs field can give mass to charge quarks and leptons as well as the W and Z. The Higgs was originally invented to give mass to the W and Z, those particles responsible for the weak interaction. The quark masses are proportional to how strongly each quark couples to the Higgs field. So if you're mathematical at all, the reason the top quark is heavy is that the coupling of the top quark to the Higgs field is large. It's basically a number. So physicists satisfy themselves by writing a big number in an equation and say, there, we understand it. But, uh, you know, we, we take that with a grain of salt. So this is Peter Higgs, Weinberg, and Salam credited with uh, uh, this great idea. Okay, this is an interesting point. So the up and down quarks have slightly different masses because they couple slightly differently to the Higgs field. And so the neutron is slightly heavier than the proton. If it was the other way around, you'd have a problem. So the lighter particle is the stable particle. So when the neutron decays, it goes into the stable proton, and now you can make the atom, because the proton is the, the, the nucleus of the hydrogen atom. So the free proton is stable to decay to the neutron from an energy standpoint. This is important for us to have a stable proton around which we built our periodic table. 
So there's there's just a subtlety there that if it would have gone the other way, very small difference actually, you wouldn't have had atoms. It's also true that the electron gets its mass from the Higgs field. And so again, if the electron mass was zero, the electron orbit would be infinite and you couldn't form atoms. So nature has relied on the Higgs field in both cases. One, in terms of what we have for the nucleus, and second, for the mass of the electron. Okay, so now we combine all our thoughts now. CP violation, remember, particle, antiparticle behaving a little differently, the mixing of the quarks and the Higgs. And so this is a uh, three by three matrix. For uh, the aficionados, we call it the CKM matrix. And the important thing here is this matrix describes that mixing in great detail and completely accurately. We have to put the numbers in it, so these are measured quantities. But other than that, it it's perfectly describes what I've been telling you. And so the quark sector, to a large degree, we feel comfortable with. It's understood. The CP violation comes from this phase in this corner here. You'll see it appear in a couple of other places. And it has a value of 67 degrees. If you now take the CP violation from the quark sector, which we know exists, and ask ourselves, is this enough to explain the matter-antimatter asymmetry in the universe? The answer is not even close. So for a long time, it was just, let's go look for it any, any old place, and, and people were looking all over. But now we're starting to zero in on the neutrinos. We're now starting to see the neutrinos seem to be saying, we are going to have very large CP violation. And so that's the... That's going to be the thrust of our research here. So the CP violation observed in the quark sector is too small to explain the matter-antimatter asymmetry in the universe. There's something called leptogenesis. It's a theory that says the leptons may play a role. Remember, neutrinos are, electron, are uh, leptons. The neutrinos are candidates. And it's actually quite easy if there are heavy neutrinos. Now, we only see those three dots. So I've said there were three. We don't actually know how many there are, and that's one of the big questions. The Nobel Prize was given out for the Higgs, so that's a good thing. That business is done. Exciting year. First time that the entire New York Times science section was devoted to a single story. It must have been a slow news day. Right? All right. So the recent observation of the Higgs boson at CERN is a discovery of the century. I was quoted in some, some magazine as saying that. I thought that was quite good. You have to think of something catchy to say, right? Of course, this is the beginning of the century, so it's obviously absurd. Interacting with the Higgs field is how elementary particles acquire mass. That's a key thing. The Higgs boson is the particle associated with the Higgs field. We can get into bosons and fields if you want. Mass is highly concentrated energy, equals mc squared. Will we ever make practical use of the Higgs discovery in the coming decade? Does anybody want to hazard a guess? Just put your hand up. Will it be practical to use it? I'm afraid that the people with their hands up are outnumbered by the silence from everyone else. <laughs> well, history says you will use it. So here's what I think. This is what's going to happen. It's the Higgs battery. Mass is the densest form of stored energy. It's got to be the best battery that was ever created. So understanding the physics of how nature stores energy in the mass is, in mass is the ultimate goal. When the universe was begun, Big Bang, however you want to say it, everything was massless. It wasn't until 10 to the minus 12 seconds after the Big Bang, which is a long time. 10 to the minus 12 seconds, my goodness. All those aged particles. Then they got mass. So something's traveling at the speed of light, and then all of a sudden it's not. Somehow you've converted kinetic energy into potential energy. So nature knows how to do that. Can the Higgs field be turned on and off? So that's a question for you inventors. This would transfer kinetic energy to potential energy. It's not quite what Uncle Ben was thinking about, but it's, it's not bad. Okay. 
So, manipulation would be the next step, and you're welcome to file a pat patent, but please, please include my, uh, you haven't heard that anywhere else, by the way. All right, rocket propulsion. You all see Star Wars, so antimatter has the highest specific energy in existence. It's the same as matter, but it's stored energy again. 10 grams will get you to Mars, by some estimates. The problem is we don't have a lot of antimatter. But if you think about what happens in the annihilation process, which if you get a PET scan in a hospital, positron emission tomography scan, you take a positron inside your body, it annihilates with an electron, that's mass, and it's converted into pure energy, two gamma rays. So nature does the reverse for us all the time, as long as we have it. So that mechanism is out there. Now, I wouldn't quote Fermilab here because this is kind of a silly thing, so I'll, I'll push it on the Europeans and say, researchers at CERN point out that it would take some large number of dollars. They use euros, by the way, but all right, they say dollars here. 100 billion years of running their accelerator to produce that much antimatter. So we haven't figured that out. However, if you look this up, there are people who are trying to collect antimatter from clouds. Cloud, there's actually a fair number of positrons on clouds because they, the, the charges divide and create with all the uh, energy associated with the, uh, let's say, the electrical potential there. So people are looking uh, more. I could not have made this easier. The hydrogen atom, H, plus pigs minus P, Higgs. Bo, General Zog trapped in the phantom zone. <laughs> Bo zone, pair. Tickle, pear tickle, <laughs> Higgs, boson, particle, how could you not get that? So now you can get it. All right, Higgs and the mysteries of mass. So the discovery of the Higgs boson verifies the Higgs mechanism of generating mass for the W and Z bosons. Remember I told you that was really why it was invented. The Yukawa couplings of the Higgs field, so Yukawa is a famous Japanese scientist, uh, coupling of the Higgs field to the quarks and the charged leptons can give the masses proportion, proportional to the vacuum value of the Higgs field. Now this is an interesting number because this is the mass of the top quark. This tells you that the coupling of the top quark to the Higgs field is one. Now physicists love that. Uh, there's obviously something happening there if it's one. So uh, you don't have to understand this equation, but what I want you to understand is that's the Yukawa coupling, so it's some number. This is the 174 GV. This is a left-handed electron and a right-handed electron. So the way the Higgs mechanism works is the following. It converts a left-handed electron into a right-handed electron. And that goes back and forth. And it's that frequency, that energy of associated with the left-handed electron. Remember, let me say what a left-handed electron is. A left-handed electron is an electron that's moving in that direction and its spin is pointing in the backwards direction. And a right-handed electron, the spin points in the same direction of motion. So when I say left-handed, it really is a symmetry of space that I'm talking about. The actual technical world word is chirality. But you can just think of it as a left hand and a right hand. They don't match. You know, you can't put your left glove on your right hand and so on. So what the Higgs mechanism is, is, is back to the idea that mass is actually kinetic energy. So at some point, Electrons in the early universe were massless. The Higgs field turns on, and all of a sudden they start oscillating back and forth between a left-handed electron and a right-handed electron. And they do that, and depending on that frequency, so most of you would know that energy is h bar nu is, is, a, is an example of where frequency tells you the energy of something. So the frequency of that back and forth between the left-handed and right-handed component of the electron tells you its mass. But the top quark, that frequency is much higher. So the higher the frequency, the higher the energy, the higher the mass. So that's how nature gives mass to the elementary quark. 
So that's what this drawing is telling you. So here's time, here's space. This is a massive particle at rest, that's the dot. It's angular momentum or intrinsic angular momentum, which we call spin, is pointing in this direction. And now it's starting to move. And so what you see is that when the spin is pointing to the, this, the spin is always going to be pointing to the right, but as the particle changes direction, that projection is turning it left and right. So this is the schematic, if you like, of the Higgs mechanism. This is how the particle is getting its mass, and that frequency will determine the mass. So what is the neutrino? Well, first of all, it means the little one. The existence of the neutrino was postulated in 1930 as an explanation of the apparent non-conservation of energy in the process of radioactive decays. Neutrino is an elementary particle, has no electric charge, travels at nearly the speed of light, remember it's got a little bit of mass, and passes through ordinary matter with virtually no interactions. And as you'll see, the neutrino is just a different particle. Neutrinos are difficult to study because they interact with ordinary matter only through the weak interaction. So it's, it's, it's nothing for a neutrino to travel through a light year of lead. In fact, several light years of lead. Four light years of lead, there's a 50% chance it gets through. So, you know, I, I remember my, my giving my son a tour of the tunnel at Fermilab, and, and the physicist giving the tour says, how, how much lead do you think, my son's a lawyer, by the way, how much... Uh, how thick uh, lead do you think a neutrino can go through? And he says, I don't know, maybe that much? Longer, longer, light years of lead. So it doesn't interact very much. They have their own mixing, which may or may not have the same origins of quark mixing. But neutrinos oscillate a billion times slower than mesons mix. So remember I told you three trillion times a second for the B sub S meson? This is a billion times slower. I gave you this number, 100 billion per second passing through your thumbnail. Neutrinos were created about one second after the Big Bang. We refer to them as relic neutrinos. There's about 150 per cubic centimeter. And you say, well, how can there be so many? Well, they're actually traveling at the speed of light. So there's a lot of them going through you. These relic neutrinos from the Big Bang have never been detected. That's an outstanding experimental problem. And there's more neutrinos than any other matter particle. So there's lots of them. So you get neutrinos from the sun. You get neutrinos from cosmic rays. You get neutrinos from bananas. Do you know how many per second? One, roughly one. It's OK. You can eat your bananas. You'll be OK. Nuclear power plants. Physicists love nuclear power plants because there's so many neutrinos coming out of them. You can do your experiment. In fact, that's how they were discovered, right, the first time. And then when a star explodes, a supernova explosion. So the heavy elements that make up you and me, the gold in your ring, for example, was created in a supernova explosion. And that the creation of those heavy elements are catalyzed by the neutrinos in the explosion. And those neutrinos from supernova 1987A were actually detected by the experiment in Japan that I showed you earlier. And when the star exploded, 50,000 years ago. How many of you know who Tom Stoppard is? Very good. So Tom Stoppard's a friend of mine. And, and I, I, I described to him all the things we were doing. And I said, which of those things did you find most interesting? And he said, the neutrinos detected from the supernova explosion. Because it's from the large metallic cloud. So it's 50,000 light years away. So 50,000 years ago, the star exploded. And the first thing to come out of the star is the neutrinos, because they just get through everything. The light's scattering around. It can't get out, so it takes a long time to get out. So the neutrinos get to the Earth before the light gets to the Earth. But the point is, 50,000 years ago, depending on your view of uh, primates and so on, modern human beings were only just on the Earth. So the star explodes, the neutrinos start on their way to the Earth, and then, you know, 10 years before they arrive at the Earth, physicists decide they're going to build a huge water detector, and then they're still coming, they're still coming, there's this wave of neutrinos, 
and then a week before they arrive, they have a meeting to decide whether they should turn the detector off to clean the water. Fortunately, they wanted to go on vacation, so they decided to delay turning off the detector, and then they detected the neutrinos. But it's truly amazing that they started 50,000 years ago, and we only just detected them. They actually detected 10 neutrinos. It's not very many. So the experiment I'm going to describe to you in a little bit, which we call lb and &E, not too exciting, long baseline neutrino experiment, we expect to detect tens of thousands of neutrinos from an exploding star. So that's, that's sort of the gain that one hopes to have. All right, how do you make a neutrino beam? It's pretty easy. A few people said to me, there's no accelerators at Fermilab. I about fainted. That's my job. My goodness. Proton beam strikes a target, magnet focuses long decay pipe that allows these mesons to decay. The pipe, at one time, this was particle physics. Now we just use them to decay and create the neutrinos. So proton beam comes in, strikes a target, makes pions and kaons. Those pions and kaons decay into neutrinos and, and other particles, and you have a neutrino beam. So that's the story there. And we can make neutrino beams or anti-neutrino beams. And a Fermilab has the most powerful neutrino beams in the world, and we can make neutrino beams 100 times more powerful than the neutrinos from the sun. So people are getting pretty good at making neutrinos. All right, this is the tunnel. So there's, you remember the high rise here? This is a tunnel. So there's the target building. This is the uh, decay decay region where the pions and the cans are decaying into neutrinos. And then this is the near detector. And usually we have a near detector and a far detector because we want to see what they start off with and what they end with. Because remember, they change as you travel through uh, space. There's the high rise. There's the reflecting pool. Uh, this particular beam is going to send uh, neutrinos from Fermilab to the Sudan mine in Minnesota. So the way this works is the beam, because it's so easy to send a beam of neutrinos through the Earth, you just send it directly through the Earth. And that's about 10 kilometers down. And it's, uh, you can see the distance here, 735 kilometers. The people in Minnesota don't complain about us pointing the neutrino beam at them. So we're very grateful for their consideration. These are, uh, this is the near detector at Fermilab. You see it going down some shaft here, and then you can see this is the length of the detector back there. They're quite big detectors. This is underground. This is the detector at the far end. There's a person. There's the uh, layers. There are layers of detectors that come off. It's like building a ship in a bottle because you're under the ground. It's not that easy to do this. All right, so there's the beam going here all the way to Minnesota. And now we're going to talk about another detector. This is the NOVA experiment. So the, well, I just showed you one called MINOS. Now this one is a slightly different distance. So we, some people say, geez, why do you keep doing this? Well, we'll get it right yet. You know, we'll, we'll just keep moving the distance and we're trying to see because it changes as you change the distance, how much they're oscillating one into the other. So you can see the size of this. And this is just about taking data. So this is brand new. This is 14,000 tons of detector in Minnesota waiting for the neutrinos to come from Chicago. And you can stand, that was my, my see, I was a collider physicist. So I had to deal with radiation, safety, all that kind of stuff. But if you're a neutrino physicist, you can just eat your lunch in the beam. It doesn't matter. <laughs> All right, you can see how massive. There's a person. This gives you some idea. Don't drop it. How big it is. This whole hall fills up with these things. They're filled with uh, a, a doped mineral oil. So when the neutrino interacts, you get a little flash of light. And you, you can see where it is. And then you can... Uh, see what happened. All right, so now we're going to look at, remember I told you there was a matrix that described the mixing. So this is the quark matrix. And this is the, sorry, this is the quark matrix. And this is the neutrino matrix. 
just glance at those two and you can see how different they are. So let's look at this one, this corner, for quarks and for neutrinos. Quarks, neutrinos. So they're, they're similar along the diagonal, but they're really quite different where all the interesting mixing is taking place. Neutrino masses we know are less than a couple of electron volts. The top quark is 1.7 times 10 to the 11th electron volts. That's your 100 billion number that I was telling you about. The, the, the lighter quarks are still 3 million electron volts. So our challenge is to understand mathematically why this matrix is so different from this matrix. Is there a minus sign somewhere? Uh, uh, that's a good question. I'll think about that while I'm talking. So how does the Higgs talk to neutrinos? Okay, can we try to copy how the electron gets a mass, which we call a direct mass? So let's write a term which is identical to what I showed you for electrons. The problem is there's no such thing as a right-handed neutrino. It doesn't exist. There's only a left-handed neutrino. So if you're going to do that, in other words, if the Higgs mechanism is something that explains the masses of everything, the first thing you have to do is you've got to make this number, the Yukawa coupling, to be tiny. Remember I told you it was one for the top quark. So this is kind of a, what we call a natural. It's too small a number. It doesn't really make sense. So that's one problem. And the second problem is you have to invent a particle that doesn't exist. That's okay. If it's found, you get a Nobel Prize. But if it's not found, then they think you're an idiot. So you got to be careful when you do that. Now, because the weak interaction is left-handed, which means it's left-handed particles that interact, a right-handed neutrino doesn't interact. It doesn't interact with matter at all. So how are you going to find it that doesn't interact? Well, it can mix into its partner. So the mixing phenomena is now being used to look for the sterile, what we call a sterile neutrino. All right, so now we're going to invent a new type of mass, which we're going to call Majorana, which I mentioned on the bottom here. So if the neutrino is its own antiparticle, and there's no example of that, but let's just hypothesize that, the neutrino is its own antiparticle, then you can have a term which we refer to as a Majorana mass. And that would be a different type of mass from what I described to you because we're not talking about left and right anymore. So in order for that to work, there's yet another way to write that down. So there's your Yukawa coupling. This was your vacuum expectation value. You notice there's two lefts here now. And now I, in order for this to give me the small number, I have to invent something very heavy. So this is a new scale of physics. So no matter what, in both explanations, either I invent a new particle that doesn't interact, or I have to invent physics at a very high energy scale. Now some of us like 10 to the 16th GeV as an energy scale, now come up in a bit. So NOVA was the experiment I showed you. Back to the scene of the crime. This was where Ray Davis did his experiment. Remember the gold mine in, in Homestake Mine in South Dakota. So for those of you who don't know, you can drive from Chicago to South Dakota. That's how you get there. It's called lead, or is it lead? Lead, South Dakota. All right, straight through the earth one more time. So I told you, we'd get it right eventually. This is 500 miles. Now we're talking about 800 miles almost a mile underground. You know Randolph Hearst. That's his mine. That's how he got rich. That's the Hearst Empire mine we're talking about. There's, there's a few bodies underneath, I think. <laughs> Anyways, so we are talking about building a detector out of liquid air, basically, liquid argon. 87 degrees Kelvin or minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a new technology for detecting neutrinos. These are pictures of neutrinos uh, interacting in uh, liquid argon. So you can see the tracks here. The colors are telling you the ionization of the particles. So, 
So you don't see the neutrino, you just see something coming out. Nothing in, something out. And so we can now take these exquisite pictures, 35,000 tons. So I'm going to estimate that this room would hold about 100 tons of liquid argon. So we want to have 35,000 tons. So now you got a sense, and you're a mile underground, and it's a cryogenic liquid, and it's waiting for the beam to come from Fermilab. So that's the challenge. So this is the future we're talking about. The detectors would be the size of the high rise. That was just accidental, by the way. All right, so long baseline neutrinos. The goal is to observe and quantify the rate at which the muons go to electron neutrinos, measure the neutrino masses, properties of the mass, Neutrino anti neutrino beams provide important clues to understand the overall asymmetry of matter versus antimatter in the universe. So we will send neutrino beams to South Dakota for a few years, and then we'll send anti neutrino beams to South Dakota for a few years. If they're the same, no CP violation. If they're different, CP violation. We're in business. So that's the basic experiment. Neutrino astronomy, I told you, supernova neutrinos will be ready for them. These are the guys that have the best job because they, there's a supernova explosion, how often? For a century. We're overdue, by the way. So we want to build a detector very quickly because we might miss it. That would be bad. And then search for proton decay. That's the other thing that you do in these large detectors because, and I'll tell you, a lot of excitement over proton decay because the gravitational waves were telling you the scale of the inflationary period of the universe, 10 to the 16th GeV, which is where grand unified theories sit. And so that's where proton decay might come in into the picture. Lots of noise about gravitational waves. cosmic microwave background, which you're aware of. So this is a temperature map of the universe. So you're looking at the various fluctuations of temperature around, cold spots, hot spots, all around. So let's look at this as we zoom in. So this is an interesting picture. So this is time one. This is time two. This is the inflationary period in the universe, 10 to the minus 34, 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang you have fluctuations in the field, in the inflaton field, the field that's driving the inflationary expansion of the universe, which is going to start at some point. Like I said, we usually talk about the universe starting at 10 to the minus 44 seconds. You come along, things are just doing their own thing, minding their own business. 10 to the minus 34, something happens, which we call the inflationary period. You have this rapid expansion into a much larger region of space where distances are such, down here is the key to the picture, size of the event horizon. So this is how far light can travel in the period of time we're talking about. So the event horizon is about this size here. Now when you blow it up very large, the event horizon, because this takes place basically instantaneously, light can't travel any distance to speak of in 10 to the minus 34 seconds. And so all of this region can no longer talk to itself. Yet when you go and measure the temperature, you would see this temperature is identical to that temperature. The yellows are all same temperature as the other yellows. So that's what we see now. That's, that's the big puzzle of the cosmic microwave background. How can the temperature in that direction be the same as the temperature over there? They're not causally connected. The only way you can explain that, and this is Alan Goose, uh, you know, insight one night, I guess, when he was contemplating the early universe, he basically says, well, if you had this rapid expansion, you would preserve it. So it's locked in there. And these are the quantum fluctuations that took place at that period in the universe. And now they're imprinted on the sky on a, on a cosmological scale. So it's truly amazing. There's two things that have happened. There's the fluctuations in the inflaton field, which had already been observed. So that was out there already. And what you, you heard about in the last few weeks was the, the gravitational waves created by the fluctuation in the gra gravitational field. 
which is not the inflaton field. And then inflation stretched that gravitational wave, and now that's what's interacting with the light in the universe, and has caused it to be polarized, and that's what we've measured. Okay, so here's the picture of the type of telescope used. Ironically, we're associated with the other telescope. So there's two competing experiments here. The, the advisor, it's the student who's made the discovery, and it's the advisor that we work with. So there's your, still, they'll be able to confirm the data very soon. So we're now talking about an experiment that's not that big. This was assembled, you know, in a, in a small room by a few people. So tens of detectors. Now we're talking about going to half a million detectors because you want to get exquisite data now. So there's really something to chase after. This is called the South Pole Telescope, Cosmic Microwave Background Polarization Generation 4. Planning's underway. So here's another picture. Back to neutrinos for a second. So this is a picture. You recognize it now. It's the temperature fluctuations. Massless neutrinos and a small, small mass, one and a half electron volts. Think of this as the gravitational potential. So what you're seeing here in the dark spots is a deeper potential here, here. And then you come over here and you see it's gone. So because neutrinos are traveling at the speed of light, they tend to make the gravi gravitational potential more shallow. So dark matter, which is moving very slow, collects and therefore comes together and creates a deep potential, but the neutrinos spread it out. So there's a certain energy budget in the universe, and the heavier the neutrino, the shallower the potential, and you can measure that. And so that's, that's why the, the, uh, the interest of particle physicists in measuring the polarization of the microwave background, because from that you can infer the mass of the neutrino. I mentioned the fourth neutrino or the sterile neutrino. So here's a picture showing you, you remember the three, that was one ordering. And now it, there's some experimental data which people are working to confirm or not confirm that says there is an extra neutrino and it's actually quite a bit heavier. So again, the cosmological data is not sufficiently precise to determine that and the experimental data in the uh, laboratory not able to determine that. The merging of particle physics and cosmology is one of the great intellectual achievements of the past 50 years. The Economist, March 22nd, 2014. It must be correct, right? It came from the <laughs> Economist. And the title of the article was, Man Suddenly Sees the Star of the Universe. Mm -hmm. This is the story of the gravitational wave. All right, so the matter of the universe. Our observations of the cosmos suggest there is more to the story than our simple model of building blocks. The universe is made of matter. Why aren't there anti-stars and anti-galaxies? There's not. Neutrinos have mass. They contribute at least as much mass in the universe as the stars and the planets. And most of the mass in the universe and the new types of particles yet to be discovered at accelerators. So I'm going to close with just one more experiment for you to hear about. This is called Dark Energy Survey. Uh, if you read Physics Today, it's on the cover of this month's issue. Uh, this is a new telescope built at Fermilab. The camera's built at Fermilab. The telescope existed. It's in Chile. It is the world leader in dark energy research for five years, for the next five years. It's trying to understand the nature of dark energy. The cosmological constant is the amount of energy that's thought to be in the vacuum. Einstein biggest mistake, as he referred to it, where he thought the universe was static when he wrote down his, his gravitational equations. He added a term that caused it to be static, because obviously it was expanding in his equations. And then everybody says, oh, it is expanding. And so he took it out and said it must be zero. But now we see that the universe is accelerating its expansion, so we have to put it back in again. So I don't know if that's good or not, but uh, the question is, does that number change? Is, our, is, is that a uh, cosmological, the amount of energy stored? We don't know where it comes from, but it's there. So when you're creating the uh, space-time continuum as the universe is expanding, there's a certain amount of intrinsic energy there. 
nobody knows where it comes from. But the uh, question is, is that changing with time? And we're trying to make that measurement. Some number of scientists. The, the key thing here is this is a galaxy survey of 200 million galaxies. This is five years. On the 10-year on the time scale, there's another telescope, which we call LSST, which will be looking at 10 billion galaxies. So the number of galaxies in the universe are thought to be 100 billion. So we're now building a telescope that's going to want to look for dark energy properties of one-tenth of all the galaxies in the universe. So high energy physicists do this because they're interested in the dark energy. They're not astronomers, but they're working with astronomers now because the astronomers look for other things. You know, they look for stars and whatever. OK, so here's a, uh, it's a fancy camera. Its uh, first light was in 2012. 58 publications covered it in 36 countries. And Jay Leno's monologue had it, so you know you've made it. This is the first picture that came out of it. There's 62 <coughs> pixelated cameras on this thing. This is from one, one pixel, one, one, uh, yeah, one chip, one pixel. You can see the exquisite detail here. So dark energy is going to distort the shape of these galaxies. That's what it's doing. And so you're looking on a statistical basis at millions and millions of galaxies and trying to understand how their shape is being distorted by the dark energy, because the dark energy is causing the space to uh, accelerate faster than you expect. So I'm going to end with just what is the future of particle physics? So CERN holds the energy frontier. That's where all the action is now. It's in Europe. And we'll do so for the next 20 odd years. The Large Hadron Collider, it's found the Higgs, but we know there has to be new physics beyond the Higgs. We could talk about it if you want, but let me just say the theorists have put their paychecks on it. It has to be there. Just as we knew the Higgs had to be there, we know there has to be new physics. It could get the energy wrong, in which case that would be great, but okay. So that's what everybody will be looking for. So when this machine turns on again, it's going to double its energy. It'll start running next spring, spring 2015. And it could be uh, very, very exciting to see what they find. Because anything they find will be unexpected. It has to be new physics. We, we, there's so many predictions, but we really don't know. So an exciting time. We're now, this would be, uh, let's see, this would be about 14 TeV. Europe and China are planning work on a 100 TV machine. That would be 100 kilometers in circumference. Uh, the European Strategy Report, which uh, is, is their long-term thinking, has the European physicists coming to the US to study neutrinos, because that's what we're, we're trying to take over the neutrino world, if you haven't noticed tonight. And Japan is building a Higgs factory. They're going to build a 30 kilometer long electron positron collider. So each one 15, if you like. And you're going to collide those electrons and positrons at just the energy at which the Higgs is made. And they will study it in great detail. So at the Large Hadron Collider, you know, you only make a few Higgs and you have billions and billions of collisions. So you got to dig it out. It's a needle in a haystack problem. At the electron positron collider tuned to the right energy, every other event is a Higgs. It's very, very clean. Uh, we'll see whether this happens. It's a, a very ambitious project. That's what I'm mentioning here. Mentioning here. Uh, Japan is considering an experiment like I described in South Dakota, so is Europe, but we think the Europeans are going to come and work with us, and we hope the Japanese come and work with us. Fermilab and the US particle physics is at a crossroad. So we, we were the energy frontier for 20 years, as I told you. And now we're looking to do something different. And so we've got to be able to, the way my field works is you've got to convince the rest of the world to come and work with you because it costs a lot. So that's the plan. So Fermilab in the US is committed to working in Europe on the Large Hadron Collider. We're committed to helping Japan with the Linear Collider. And we're thinking of ourselves now as the neutrino laboratory in the US. Could you hold, could you hold the questions to the end, please? Yeah, I'm finished. I'm finished. So go ahead. Were you thinking in terms of the 
Say this again. You were not thinking in terms of unification at Um it could. It could be. So, you know, for example, what people are looking for is something called supersymmetry, which could be derived from string theory, which would be the unification of gravity with quantum mechanics. So it could be. Before before we take any more <laughs> questions, do you want to finish your last I'm finished. Thank you very much. Finish. <laughs> So we have uh, runners with microphones, and when you get the microphone to ask a question, would you please stand up, state your name, tell us whether you're a member of the society you're visiting, and then ask a question. My name is Scott Matthews, and I am a new member. Um, and uh, two questions, one real quick one. Can you explain the term long baseline? Yes. And also then, can you tell us, if, if the neutrino oscillations, if flavor oscillations involve a change in mass. Is there not a viable conservation of energy there? How, how does that get avoided? Long baseline means the distance between the beam and the detector is a long distance, and in this case, 800 miles. We have short baseline experiments that are a few hundred yards. So the, the, the uh, long baseline is needed for the neutrinos to be able to interact through the Earth as it goes through and allow it to oscillate. So that's the first question. Second question was, is energy violated in this process? The quick answer is no. And the way you can think about it is the, uh, let's say we start off with a muon neutrino, because that's what we actually make. The muon neutrino is a sum of an M1, an M2, and an M3. And as you travel through space, that uh, the, the ratio of those adjust as you go along because um, the ratios are a function of distance, but you have to do that. I'm, I'm giving you a classical explanation when I do that, so you're thinking that as a fixed number as you go along that's changing, but the, the, the amount of energy available or the amount of mass available has to be conserved. So you would you would fix that in the equation as they oscillate. So the quick answer is it has to has to be conserved. What, I'm David Rosen, a lifetime member of a uh, uh, lifetime member. When we were talking about polarization, when you were talking about polarization, and they were measuring it in the cosmic background radiation, is that linear polarization or circular polarization or some type of elliptical polarization? Good question. So the, there's, there's two types of polarization that's talked about. There's so-called E mode and B mode. I was talking about the B mode, which is really a curl. If you know what I mean by a curl, no? It's, it's, a, it's a pattern, if you, if you want to think of it that way. So it's a particular pattern that comes about because the angular momentum associated with gravity is spin 2. So, yeah, sure. You can think of them as the same thing. Angular momentum, polarization, spin, they're all, uh, ultimately it's angular momentum what you're talking about. So question uh, over here. Hi, Carl Merrill, a member of the Society. You mentioned the number of supernova, but you meant only in this galaxy. Correct. First. Yeah. And then the, uh, your new telescope is for many galaxies. Yeah, but, but our neutrino detector could not, uh, it's a good question, but you know, if it was the uh, Andromeda galaxy, our neighboring galaxy, we're not so confident that we could see. It would depend a little bit on the size of the star, but we don't think we'll see neutrinos from anything but our own galaxy. And the other question I had is, in Gamow's book, The 30 Years That Shook Physics, uh -huh. he talks about uh, Dirac in, the, um, in his equations predicting anti-mass particles. Yeah. And 
I understand some people think there might be anti-mass in the anti-particles, and they've designed some experiments to look for that. Sure. So there's there's uh, there's there's a number of experiments. Uh, okay, there's an experiment at CERN, for example, which is anti-hydrogen. So it's an anti-proton with an anti-electron. So it it uh, what they've done so far is form it. They've looked at the energy level between the 2s and the 1s state to see that it's the same as hydrogen. And the answer is, of course, it is. And, uh, and then now what they want to do is try and see it fall in a gravitational field. And what you're suggesting is it would fall up rather than fall down. So they're, they're about to do that experiment in the next couple of years. I expect it to fall down. John? Uh, John Anderson, a member of the society. Uh, John, wait, who else has a question? Please raise your hand. Okay, so we'll take that person next. And how about this person over there next? Yeah, I'm getting ahead. I see he's he's next, then him, and then this fellow here. All right, John. Uh, two questions. The first, you mentioned primordial neutrinos, the Big Bang. How can we differentiate those from other neutrinos? And the second question. The cosmological constant, the big difference between the observed or experimental value versus the theoretical. Is anything with neutrinos, any ideas about how neutrinos can affect that calculation or? Cosmological constant, okay. So the first one is relic neutrinos are uh, very slow. They're, they have very little energy and that's the problem. So the probability of a neutrino interacting with matter is proportional to its energy. So as you decrease the energy, the chances of seeing it are infinitesimal. So nobody has come up with an idea of how to see them, even though the universe is a, uh, is a bath of these neutrinos. So that's your Nobel Prize if you want to uh, find them. So that's, that's the first question. Your second question was? The cosmological constant. Have neutrinos anything to do with that? Um, yeah, the answer is uh, the, the, the cosmological constant is, is trying to account, the, the quick answer is theory cannot calculate. So theory, theory tries to calculate it and you perhaps heard the, the jokes about it, you know, it's 10 to the 50 off from what you expect. Yeah, so, so there's no progress on that, if that's your question. It's, it's just, we don't know how to do it. Uh, you spoke of uh, an awful lot of particles, and I wonder, uh, does everyone have its purpose in life, or would the uh, cosmos be in trouble if there was any one of these missing? Uh, that's, a, that's, a re that's a really good question. So the, the quick answer is, it's, it, it's almost like an ecosystem. Everything plays a role in an ecosystem. So every particle plays a role. So uh, in order to have CP violation, for example, which I talked about, you need to have uh, a property of a three by three matrix is that it has three real terms and one imaginary term. The imaginary term is the complex space. So people, in fact, postulated the existence of extra quarks, and I think that was one of the motivations of uh, Kobayashi and Muskawa, that you would need three families of quarks to explain CP violation, and so the answer is you need three. And if you had four, you would have more phases, and we don't seem to see more phases. And so it is rather a tightly constrained system. It's got just what it needs to describe what we see. It doesn't have any extra, and it doesn't have not enough. That makes it the standard model, exactly. Is the question over there? I would be a little unhappy if we had more leptons than quarks. There's there's symmetries in nature that require those to be equal, also. But uh, we'll see. My name's Rudy Krutar. I'm a member of the society. According to my calculations, a hydrogen atom has a totally balanced between antimatter and matter and so is an anti-hydrogen atom, and therefore you would see a big difference in the 
how they approach each other. They won't zoom at each other until they get very close. And has anyone tried to do any studies on the attraction between hydrogen atoms and anti-hydrogen atoms? Uh, the the studies that well as I as I described a little earlier there are there are experiments that trap anti-hydrogen and they trap them with uh, in penning traps as they're called so they're electric and magnetic fields that uh, uh, trap them because as soon as they touch the surface of anything they're going to annihilate so they you're, you're going to be doing this experiment whether you like it or not because ultimately they drift to the edge. People, um, certainly I spent most of my life colliding antiprotons and protons together. That's not quite the same as hydrogen. It's not the same. So uh, I think the statement that you're asking for is there, is there experiments that uh, bring hydrogen and anti-hydrogen together? Atoms, not yet, not yet. Uh, my name is Ralph Renner. I'm just, I'm not a member of the society. I'm, I'm a very interested guest, however. Um, I'm wondering, I, a very simple question. I was just wondering why you didn't mention the um, neutrino detector in Antarctica and um, if there are any results from that because it's about two miles down in the ice. Correct. So there, there's an experiment called Ice Cube in uh, Antarctica, which is, uh, uses the ice as a, uh, medium for, if you think about the water detector, this is the frozen water detector, and they, they, they drill holes into the ice with hot water and they, they have strings of uh, photomultiplier tubes and the same as you have in the water detector in Japan. So the principle is the same. You're just using frozen water instead of regular water. And uh, they, have, they have recently observed neutrinos from uh, our, I guess our galaxy, and maybe even outside our galaxy, for the first time. So that's uh, that's an ongoing experiment, it's a very successful experiment. But uh, it it doesn't, and I they're going to have it. They're going to. The challenge is you don't know what you're getting. Nature's beam is not well defined. That's why we make beams of particles is to be able to know exactly what you've made and exactly what their energy is and exactly what distance they've traveled. So uh, they can try and do that on a statistical basis, and that and they'll have a shot at it. And that's but what they're really looking for is what are the highest energy neutrinos that nature makes. That's kind of their goal. And and so there are uh, phenomena in the universe, uh, quasars, and so on, which produce very high energy neutrinos, and they're looking to detect those because you expect very few of them. So they want to be able to instrument, you know, squirk square kilometer is coming, by the way. So, you know, that's that's the direction that's going. I have one last question here. You can come up afterwards and ask questions. Yeah. In, you often ask questions, and I try to spread the questions around. Yeah, um, I don't even know whether the question makes sense, but here it goes. They're trying to, um, they're very upset that they can't get a unified explanation of the large and the small, the quantum physics and, and the gravity. Now, if matter is such a small percentage of the overall thing, could it not be that it's a small subset and therefore you might not actually expect the, the descriptions to be exactly the same? For example, between ice and water. I mean, you might have a, they're so similar, but yet you might have a completely different description. Might not that be the same between the large and the small? Yeah, so what you're referring to is the energy budget of the universe. Right. And so there's a, about 4% is in matter, 25% is in dark matter, right? I'll say regular matter. Then there's 25% is in dark matter, and then the rest is in dark energy, right? right? And so the question is, can you put a unified theory together? So my first statement is, we have no clue what dark energy is. So we just slide that to the side and we build telescopes. That's our, that's our, that's our strategy right now. Dark matter, uh, Fermilab has, has three experiments searching for dark matter underground, and so very sensitive experiments that 
uh, dark matter is, is expected to be something which interacts only gravitationally in some models. So you have to wait for it to hit an atom. And then if that atom then moves through some detecting medium, like something that scintillates, you can see it. So that's the approach of those experiments. Then at the Large Hadron Collider, there's another approach that you would be able to produce dark matter directly in the accelerator. And then there's yet another approach, which is looking uh, satellites, looking for the annihilation where you believe that there's dark matter, anti-dark matter, annihilating, making two photons. And in fact, there's a lot in the press right now about that there's possibly a signal for I that. I mean, most of our description starts from matter. Because you're, that's you're, you're absolutely correct. So we're starting with something we know extremely well and extrapolating it to something we don't know. So I, I think it's a, it's a valid concern that you might have to think outside the box, as they say, for this all to come together in a picture. And you, in fact, you're, you're, I, I guarantee you're right on that one. Some last questions? In the mid 1980s, a gentleman by the name of Joe Weber at the University of Maryland postulated that neutrino should have coherent regular labs, provided the labs had sufficiently high temperature. Was he nuts, or, or is there some possibility of detecting neutrinos in coherent interactions with periodic lapses? There are uh, people doing experiments on that. That has not been shown to be true yet, but uh, the answer is he's not nuts and, and uh, coherent. The way I think of coherent scattering is that, uh, and you do it with nuclei in, in my business, so if you were to scatter off of a hydrogen nucleus and then you went to, uh, let's say, helium, you would say, well, I understand I'm going from a nucleus with, you know, charge of one to, or one nucleon to four nucleons. Is there an effect that takes place when the neutrino scatters off of the entire nucleus as a whole, or does it look like four individual particles? That's not been observed yet, but people think that's going to, that could possibly happen. That's, that's a pretty tough thing to calculate. So it's waiting for experiments. So uh, thank you, Nigel. One more. I have a question on your opinion about doing some of this detection. You mentioned about the ice cube experiment where a lot of the neutrinos that enter naturally from space are different distances, et cetera. Yes. But what about something where you have those different scintillating materials, but you could, what do you think about doing it as a distributed experiment? Like uh, you have a bunch of high schools put together uh, detectors and just fields of them and then collecting that data and aggregating it. What do you think about the possibility of that? Well, that happens with cosmic rays now, as you may know. So there, there, is, there, is a, there is a program that distributes cosmic ray detectors all around the country. They're in Canada, they're in the United States. And so what they look for is uh, showers of various sizes. So if it's a small cosmic shower, maybe it only lights up a uh, a small area, but if it's the size of the country, it would light up everybody at the same time. So those kind of things take place, but there's, uh, uh, for neutrino detectors, there's only a handful around the world, uh, but nevertheless, the neutrino detectors are now part of a, uh, uh, a system that is waiting for a star to explode and as I told you, the neutrinos arrive quite a bit earlier than the light. And so the Hubble Space Telescope is ready to point in a particular direction if neutrinos were observed all around the planet uh, coming from a particular direction. So that, that would really be exciting, I think, to get the neutrinos and then you just say, it's going to explode up there tomorrow. Then you can put that in the New York Times. And then uh, the star explodes and you see it. So that would be quite something. So people are do think like that now. Good question. So if that's the last question so that we can move on, because we have to be out of this room at a certain time, which is 20 minutes to 11. You can bring your other questions up afterwards. I'm sure you'll be happy to 
talk more. Price goes up with time. So if we can just have a round of applause for our speaker. And an appreciation for the lecture tonight. We'd like to give you this copy of the announcement of your talk signed by members of the general committee. Ah, thank you very much. Thank you so much for giving the talk. Um, if you leave this up to a minute.